Welcome at the Italian Design Day. We are speaking from Washington, but we are connected uh, with many other locations. Uh, today, uh, from Washington, uh, the topic uh, will be about women's perspective uh, on urban regeneration. And uh, I'm very happy uh, to say that uh, this webinar was made possible uh, by the collaboration between uh, the Italian Cultural Institute of Washington, the Italian Embassy in Washington, uh, Jefferson Italy Center, Jefferson Institute for Smart and uh, Healthy Cities of Philadelphia. And of course, uh, many other institutions that uh, uh, everybody will uh, meet uh, as soon as uh, the speakers uh, will uh, enter the video. Uh, first of all, I am very happy to introduce uh, Mariangela Zappia, uh, the ambassador of uh, Italy to the United States, and I will leave her uh, the ground. Good afternoon to you all, and thank you, Professor Finotti, for the introduction. I am very glad to open this webinar for the sixth edition of the Italian Design Day in the United States, organized by the Italian Embassy and the Italian Cultural Institute in Washington, D.C., in cooperation with the Italy Center of Jefferson University. I wish to thank the director of the Jefferson University Italy Center, Dr. Ignazio Marino, as well as Professor Barbara Klinkhammer, Dean at the Jefferson University, who will chair this interesting conversation. Panelists from both Italy and the United States will animate today's event. In particular, allow me to mention Paola Navone, who is our Design Ambassador for Design Day 2022, and Alessandro Melis, architect and curator. Today, uh, we will listen to a very interesting discussion on women's perspective on urban regeneration, as this year's theme for the Design Day is Regeneration, Design and New Technology for a Sustainable Future. There is no better way to highlight the role of Italian designers and architects in defining new patterns for the future, especially given the increased role that women have in our society and economy. In architecture, like in many other professions, women today are key to the economic advancement of communities. The post-pandemic world has shown that their contribution is, is not just fair by principle, but is also, and most importantly, necessary. In a vastly male-dominated profession, women architects and designers compose a dynamic and influential segment in the profession, in Italy as well as in the United States. An increasing female perspective in architecture brings innovation, offers opportunities for collaboration to seek new ideas, and creates well-rounded design. Our changing societies and economies requires more women able to imagine an environment that reflects our values and aspirations for equality, for environmental stewardship, for a society that can be balanced and inclusive, conscious of the need of the feminine part of the population. There are and have been inspirational women architects and city planners. One of the most influential works on contemporary urban design comes from a woman author, Jane Jacobs. In 1961, she published her most famous book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, translated into Italian in 1969. The book is a critique of cities as renewable resources, or Gwendalina Salimei and Laura Peretti, who have both been working on the regeneration of Corviale, a controversial housing project designed in the 70s in Rome. These are just some examples of how women architects are contributing highly to our society, also through the redefinition of urban spaces. Therefore, I'm looking forward to hear more today about Italian and American women designers' work and vision. Let us hear all about it. I wish you a fruitful uh, discussion on this 2022 Design Day. Grazie. A pleasure to introduce Ignazio Marino, uh, who is uh, the executive director of uh, Jefferson Italy Center. Thank you very much. I'm really delighted uh, to attend this uh, webinar and it's uh, a pleasure and a honor to have uh, Ambassador Zappia introducing a group of ladies well known for their professional achievements. I just want to share with you a couple of slides showing how critical is 
the women perspective in uh, urban regeneration. And I'm so happy that uh, Ambassador Zapia mentioned uh, Paola Vigano because uh, my slides actually have to do with her work. I will uh, share the screen now. This is, a, uh, for whoever is not familiar uh, with uh, the urban design of Rome, this area is uh, at the walking distance from Piazza del Popolo. So really in the, in the, in the heart of Rome and has been abandoned from the late uh, 50s. So it was an old military barrack place. And uh, um, the idea was to change so using a regeneration project, so not using a new land, but existing land for a new purpose. So we launched the international uh, um, tender and um, we had 246 candidates from 20 countries, mostly from Europe, but also from USA, Middle East and Australia. And the winner was uh, Paola Vigano. And the reason why she won was because, uh, uh, probably because she's a woman, so she's a different kind of uh, uh, sensibility to environment, uh, climate changes, uh, and our society. She decided to uh, design a project entirely based uh, from, the, from, the, from the point of view of energy on geothermal energy. So the entire, uh, that entire area of Rome, we rely on the use of geothermal for heat, uh, for, uh, um, for cooling, and also for general electricity. So I was very happy that she won and that thank you for uh, uh, having me with you today and I wish you a successful discussion. Thank you very much Ignazio Marino. Now I, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Alessandro Medis, uh, Chair the Professor at the um, New York Institute of uh, Technology uh, and uh, a dear friend of uh, the uh, Institute, the Cultural Institute in Washington and I would say uh, in New York too. Uh, Alessandro, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to deeply thank Ambassador Zapia and Fabio Finotti for this significant opportunity to share a diverse point of view on the game-changing role of women today. I think this is a key moment and especially today we see that uh, if we consider uh, current events, how important it is to share this new perspective. I would like to take the chance to introduce the chair of the event, Barbara Klinkhammer, an accomplishment, uh, accomplished scholar, design educator and architect. Barbara Klinkhammer serves as dean of the College of Architecture and the Built Environment at Thomas Jefferson University. Previously, she held faculty and administrative leadership position at the University of Tennessee and the Bauhaus University in Weimar. Klinkhammer brings a deep understanding of the contemporary professional design world and the timely vision of the future of architecture and design education. Uh, she co-founded the Jefferson Institute for Smalt and Deltish Cities and has framed the discourse of contemporary architecture through research, publication, practice, and participation in international design competition. Uh, Klinkhammer holds uh, the German equivalent of the Bachelor and Master's degree in architecture and does practices with their firm, Klinkhammer and Stack Architecten, in Europe, Asia, and Middle East. Barbara, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alessandro. Thank you, Professor Fabio Finotti. I really appreciate all the introductions, and I'm very honored to be here today. Thank you to all the ones here that are assembled today to make this a wonderful day and to celebrate the Italian Design Day 2022. Um, so let me share my screen. I'm assuming everybody can see this. All right, hello everybody. Buongiorno a tutti in Italia and those speaking Italian here. And welcome to our webinar and panel discussion 
Italica Women's Perspective on Urban Regen Regeneration, an event organized by the Italian Embassy and the Italian Cultural Institute in Washington, in cooperation with the Jefferson University Italy Center and the Jefferson Institute for Smart and Healthy Cities to celebrate the 2022 Italian Design Day. I'm very excited to be here today with an elaborate group of women architects, designers, urbanists, activists, and educators. Many thanks to Professor Alessandro Melis, the curator of the event and ambassador of the Italian Design Day, as well as Professor Fabio Finotti, director of the Italian Culture Institute in Washington and the Italian ambassador for inviting me to chair and moderate the event. Without further ado, let me introduce today's topic. According to the latest report on world inequality published in 2021, the global lack of economic and social justice appears to be one of the primary reasons for the current environmental crisis. There's an urgent need for a more equitable, inclusive and diverse society. Putting aside ideological differences is crucial to forging an effective response to the unpredictable and rapid effects of climate change. Moreover, the high rate of carbon emissions plaguing today's cities is largely the result of poor urban planning, attributed almost exclusively to middle-aged white Western men, and points to the need for diverse perspectives in the design of liberal spaces for future communities. According to the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the achievement of gender equality and the emancipation of women and girls as expressed in Objective 5, achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls, are pivotal to alleviate urban marginalization through the creation of sustainable cities and communities. A vast scientific literature also confirms that our ability to regenerate cities in times of environmental crisis will depend on an increase in diversity as a reservoir of effective decision-making possibilities. For women who globally rely more than men on community networks, walkability, short distances to the next food resource and close by social networks, the emphasis for neighborhood and city planning would probably have been very different compared to that of men. Safety, gathering spaces, nearby parks and schools and other aspects that impact daily life would have been more important than economic gain, demonstrations of power in the physical gestalt of the city or the dominance of the car that has shaped cities since the 1950s. What would have happened if cities around the globe would have been shaped by, more, by a more democratic process, inclusive policymaking and community engagement? Would we have seen the same urban marginalization, segregation and economic deserts we see in some, some cities? Or would we have been able to build livable cities for an equitable, inclusive, and diverse society? Will we be able to combat the disastrous consequences of climate change on our cities by creating inclusive development and design processes that bring in multiple perspectives? Thus, the webinar will focus on, a women, on women's perspective as a game-changing agent with regard to current city regeneration trends. I want to lead into the discussion with a quote from Jane Jacobs from her book that was actually also just quoted by our ambassador, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. Cities have the, capabil have the capability of providing something for everybody only because and only when they are created by everybody. Let's begin. Let me introduce our first speaker. Our distinguished guest and ambassador of, Italy, of the Italian Design Day 2022, Paola Navone. I'm honored to introduce her today. She's an architect, designer, art director, interior designer, critic, teacher, and organizer of exhibitions and events, and received her degree in architecture from the Politecnico di Torino. Between 1970 and 1980, she worked alongside Alessandro Mendini, Ettore Sozzas, and Andrea Branzi, in the Alchemia Group, the most progressive set on the Italian design scene, 
developing a highly productive and stimulating avant-garde stance, which gained her in 1983 the prestigious Osaka International Design Award, bestowed for the first time that year. She has worked for many clients, including Abit Laminati, Armani Casa, Noll International Alessi, Piazza Sempione, Mando, Driade, Horizonti, Arcade, Oltre Frontiera, Casa Milano, Anton, Ale Anton Agelli, Dada, Molteni, Natuzzi, Roche Bobois, and Swarovski being only some examples. Please welcome Paola Navone. Let me stop sharing. I'm architect by accident. Uh, why by accident? Because I was trying to do always the opposite of what I was asked to do. So one side, the other side, turn left, turn right. One day I find my, found myself in the Polytechnic School in Torino. Very tough school, but that's the story. Everybody's asking me about my life of woman and architect. I think I do this job more because I'm very stubborn and uh, I don't know exactly what does mean uh, this uh, uh, being woman and doing this job. I, uh, I don't know exactly the, uh, the meaning of this kind of question. I know very well that I want, I, I want to do something and I manage to do it. Uh, probably my efforts are bigger than a man efforts or probably not this I, I don't have a real answer to this uh, question I have a vision which is a vision of uh, uh, environment very friendly always uh, uh, with a very uh, good light. I employ many, many different kinds of material. I like to merge material that come from different world, industrial material, um, craft material, uh, recycle material. And uh, at the end of the story is like a cake uh, or omelet. My, the result of my work is uh, different element together with a nice uh, uh, proportion and nice um, cooking. One of uh, interesting uh, example of this um, combination of different material is a project that I did in Thailand where I really make use of a lot of waste waste from the wooden industry, waste from the ceramic industry, and um, also uh, I use a very um, expensive and rich material combined with a very simple uh, piece of picassiet, piece of small uh, uh, tiles. Result, you, you don't see the, the difference anymore. You take advantage of the atmosphere, which is very um, rich on texture, is rich on uh, heritage, but is also very modern in the, in the final uh, output. So I learned uh, a word, a Thai word, uh, ta -ma -da. and uh, everybody was talking about Tamada, all the workers, all the people working with me. So I was very curious. I asked my franco thai friend, uh, what does mean Tamada? Because I'm, when I come, everybody talk about Tamada. And my friend told me, oh, Tamada means ordinaire. And I thought it was a very beautiful way to explain my approach to this project where I use uh, sometimes very simple waste of wood with no value, no commercial value and next to it I use maybe 
gold leaves, or I use uh, broken tiles, and next to it, uh, car wood. So um, I found this work, Tamada, really very, very uh, good for, to explain what uh, is my approach to architecture. Thank you so much, Paula. I really appreciate your view of the uh, of your design process and uh, how this fits in today's day. Thank you very much. Um, we will now go into um, presenting the panelists and speakers of today's panel. I will do this by um, introducing all of you at once and then give you a clue at the time um, of sharing your presentation when it's time for you. We will start with uh, Francesca Pirani. Let me just go and share my screen here for one second. Francesca Pirani graduated in architecture from the Politecnico di Milano, trained in Belgium, Australia, and the UK. In 2007, she established Francesca Pirani Enterprise, an award-winning studio based in Bergamo, Italy. She is the co-founder and curator of, not -for -profit, of the not-for-profit association Rebel Architect, originally a creative collective of art, art key activists raising awareness of the need for equality in, in the architectural fields at national and international levels and providing a fairer landscape of role models for the future generation of architects. She is also the founder of Cutout Mix, an internationally popular free open platform as an answer to the growing need for more equal and diverse cutouts population design renders. The practice is driven by the power of shared creativity as an effective instrument to bring about change. We will then be followed by Maria Pervellini, who is the Dean of the School of Architecture and Design at the New York Institute of Technology and a tenured professor of architecture. She holds a Bachelor of Architecture from the Istituto Universitario di Architettura di Venezia in Italy and a Master's of Architecture from Pratt Institute in New York. Prior to NYIT, Pebellini was the Associate Dean for Graduate Programs and the Chair of Instruction in the College of Architecture at Texas Tech University. She also taught at the School of Architecture, University of Texas at Austin. Pebellini is the co-founder of Pongratz Pebellini Architects, PPA. Before establishing her own practice, she worked in New York City for Peter Eisenman and John Reinitz on the design of prestigious commissioned buildings and international design competitions. She's the author of several books and her latest publication focuses on resilient communities and the Pacholi Charter. She has been notably recognized, including the 2018 AIA Long Island Educator Award, Recent appointments include contributions to the Italian Pavilion at the 17th International Architecture Exhibition at the Venice Biennale 2021, as curator of an external section in New York, co-curator of the section architecture as a caregiver, and one of the creative directors of the Virtual Italian Pavilion. Eva Castro Iraola, Iraola is a professor of practice at ASD Singapore University, where she currently is the coordinator of Core Studio 2 and co-leads the Advanced Options Studio on Landscape Urbanism. She has been the director of the Landscape Urbanism Unit at Tsinghua University in Beijing and a visiting professor at the Architecture Association in London, where she taught as a diploma unit master and the director of the Landscape Urbanism Master Program since 2003. She also held positions as visiting professor at HKU Hong Kong and as honor, honorary professor at Xi'an University of Architecture and Technology. Castro is the co-founder founder, founder of Form Axioms Lab, a territorial agency for academic research purposes operating from within SUTD Singapore. Eva Castro will be presenting together with Ulla Hell, who is a trained architect in Austria and the Netherlands and a registered architect in Europe and holds the Italian equivalent of the bachelor's and master's degree in architecture from the University of Innsbruck. 
After collaborating with different studios in Italy, Austria, and United Kingdom, and after a study visit at the Ciudad Abierta Ritoque in Valparaio in Chile, Ulla joined Plasma Studio in London, founded by Eva Castro and Holger Kine. In 2003, Ulla opened her office, opened her office in Italy and operated since then as a partner of Plasma Studio. Since 2012, Ulla is involved as a guest lecturer at the University of Innsbruck and the Institute for Städtebau. Ulla has experience in all phases and scales of architecture, architectural and urban project with focus on system, systemic context and material driven architecture and a strong interest in the building processes of architecture. Ulla is a regular, regularly member of juries and her projects are widely published and awarded with several prizes. Dr. Silvia Barbero is an associate professor in design at the Politecnico di Torino and deputy coordinator of the degree courses in design. She teaches environmental requirements for products in design and communications, open systems and a master's degree in systemic design and systemic design for territorial development in the PhD program in management and production and design. Leading the systematic design lab at the Politecnico di Torino, her main field of research is the sustainability of industrial processes through a systematic design approach. She co-founded the Ecopac Observatory in 2005 and is currently the chair of the International Systemic Design Association. Siva Barbero is the author of many books and more than 100 articles in scientific journal and proceedings in international conferences. With that, I will start, we will start with Francesca Ferrani. Francesca, you're ready? Yes, I'm ready, thank you. Um, I will share my screen. Okay. Thank you for having me at this panel today. I'm very honored to speak on behalf of the whole uh, team I represent. This is our collective. We started as creative activists and we are now an official not-for-profit association. Since the very beginning, we have been supported and inspired by more than 50 international advisors and associations. But the main, the main goal remained the same, which is to detox architecture from inequalities as a plural act, starting from a gender perspective. In order to do so, we give visibility with online open source tools to a new system of female role models. And here you can view our first e-publication and our main website featuring the WOW map, Women Architects World Map, which is featuring 1,000 outstanding profiles. I take this opportunity to show you our work through the curatorial project we just presented at the latest Venice Biennale of Architecture in the Italian Pavilion, where the curator, Alessandro Melis, asked us to bring the excellence of Italian women architects and their potential to decolonize the built environment. We decided to introduce our installation with this statement. How can we be credible interpreters of the transformation of the living space if our own profession does not recognize within itself the values of inclusion and the equality that we expect from the built environment today? This introduces our first curatorial work where we deal with the painfully evident gender gaps affecting Italian female architects. I need to start by saying that in Italy, we experience a very competitive, harsh professional environment. We have the same number of architects you have in the whole United States and one third of the total of the Europeans. Women architects are 42% and registered female architects under the age of 35 reached the 55%. Unfortunately, women still earns 50% less than their male colleagues, 
And this is one of the reasons that make them leaving the profession very lowly. It's clear to us that Italian architecture is very female then, but is still so unbearably invisible. Gender discrimination is very much in place. Not only we all experience the lack of female role models in university studies, but this continues in public events. For example, our research on more than 400 events in Italy shows that 37% were all male panels, including some with up to 20 male speakers. 3,823 3, male speakers versus 994 female speakers. One more data I want to share with you is the composition of partners in the same studio. Out of the 117 successful studios we selected, a very large number of them, in fact, the 56%, are founded by a couple women and men, very often partners in life and work, 37% by a single woman and 7% by a full female team. We believe this data shows that in Italy, it's very common that women who can share work and family care are advantaged when it comes to reaching levels of excellence in the profession an issue that comes in other competitive disciplines. On the second wall, we propose a, a potential solution to gender discrimination, choosing to deliver 137 outstanding Italian female architects and calling them by their name, architette. This is the professional term declined in the feminine, the use of which is still being resisted by Italian society. Yes, also now in 2022. We didn't bring a small selection of professional, but instead a choral project of research prioritizing new interpretations of the profession. Women identified through a research that is new, cooperative, mindful of an eco-feminist system of values where the positive impact on the community is favored over the aesthetic strength. You may find architects, designers, builders, influencers, visionaries, and you can check also their availability on taking part in public events on the dedicated website. I would like to close this talk sharing with you some of these outstanding architects. Here you can see Marta Maccaglia. She is an Italian architect working in Peru. She founded the NGO Semillas in 2014, dealing with architecture projects and research in the Peruvian Amazon Emerging Contest, specializing in participatory processes as well as sustainable structures. Her association delivered the construction of 10 schools in just 10 years. Here you can see Paola Serritu. Since 2011, through her co-founded association Landworks, she has dedicated herself to redevelopment of abandoned areas. She designs innovative projects based on experimental multidisciplinary artistic production in order to create a permanent process of social enrichment and positive cultural impact. She's currently working on the former mining village of Argentiera in Sardinia, as you can view here. Lara Sappa is an architect. She founded Studio Ficina 82 with Fabio Rivetria. The studio deals with uh, microarchitecture, restoration, landscape design. But we've been really captured by her project Stars Box, a sustainable, replicable structure dedicated to micro hospitality. 
It is inspired by temporary sheds of the shepherds of the Ligurian Alps and focuses on the conscious use of natural environments. Here you see Liga Studio, is an architectural and interior design practice founded by Licia and Gaia Trapani. Two Sicilian sisters and their strong passion for the sea is clear in every of them of their projects. Their design, reimagining the past with a contemporary and intimate Mediterranean approach. Sara Lucetta, she is an interior designer and she arrives in Umbria where she discovers her passion for raw earth and strawberry buildings. After that, she decided to found Terra e Paglia, an artisan construction company dealing with natural materials and sustainable constructions. She works not only as a builder, but also as a trainer. Finally, also mention to the important work carried by Toponomastica Femminile, an Italian association monitoring and proposing female toponymy of urban spaces, streets, squares, statues, entitled to distinguish women. What we are proposing as rebel architecture is eco-feminist design which aims to be sustainable and inclusive as an expression not only of the work of female architects, but of all those interested in a radical change that leads to overcoming the fragility of the built space and its inhabitants. Rebel architecture leaves you with the final mantra, which is making space, not only taking it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Francesca. Wonderful presentation. Um, really looking forward to discussing this in our panel discussion. Um, please stop sharing so that uh, Maria Pervellini can go next. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. I'm very pleased to be part of this outstanding group of women and architects and researchers. I would like to take uh, this opportunity to talk about the power of education and the power of mentorship in inspiring the next generation of diverse talent and responsible excellence. The importance of encouragement as in my role as Dean, but also as an educator to achieve ambitions while overcoming challenges and being true to ourselves against stereotypes or bias comes a long way toward gender equality. Female representations in architecture, practice and academia, as we just saw from Francesca and from uh, the introduction that Barbara gave us before, in a male dominated profession is still low, uh, but actually in schools, we have 50% of our students that are women However, we have only 17% of registered architects in the United States that are women. So there is something there that needs to be addressed uh, in school and in education. More so at all levels of leadership, governance, public forums, large scale community level, women need to be encouraged to bring the valuable perspectives to policy and practice. If we want women's voice uh, to be central to urban planning and to the regeneration of more socially balanced and inclusive communities. The exclusion of diverse uh, points of view during the design process it does not help to address our collective needs. Uh, voices and perspectives should be not only included, but heard, acknowledged and valued. Uh, we have here some examples of one of our faculty, Farzana Gandhi, uh, at this challenging but unique time of opportunities at New York Tech, uh, we focus on the urgency to address correlational crisis and we build a different approach to our future with civic engagement. 
And in this work of Farzana, uh, she has a research on relief, reconstruction, resiliency with courses and workshops in Puerto Rico, but also in Harlem, in Brooklyn, in Africa, and in underrepresented communities. Uh, Marcella del Signore, another faculty, uh, incredible and outstanding faculty that we have uh, addressing global issues of environmental awareness, climate change, sustainable solutions, diversity and inclusion, and social responsibility that are infusing the curricula of our graduate and MS programs. Um, we have integrated uh, virtual conversations and stimulated symposia and panels and international partnerships, uh, not just with the Italian consulate, but for example, we are very also active with the Denmark consulate in the future of city, a conversation on urban regeneration in a time of crisis. And this is uh, a study from our faculty, Matthias Altwicker on densities and populations and also the relationship with typologies of some of the buildings that we have here in New York. Uh, other researchers and professionals on design innovation, resilient cities learning from science, uh, scientists, uh, entrepreneurial minds uh, that are addressing critical density from the point of view of health, ecology, economy, and equity. We have focus on young professional programs to encourage women to uh, actually take on STEAM and not STEM, STEAM related studies and careers. Many initiatives in intentionally promote diverse student leadership opportunities in academic and professional organizations, as well as in intercultural and identity-based activities. What key actions must cities take? And how critical design, design innovation, and problem framing more than problem solving can help repair our cities in order to ensure the quality of life and healthy environments while preserving existing buildings? is one of the pressing questions related to inclusivity. Design is about life, has a social connotation, it influences culture, and design sensitivity can help us to, more, to be more intentionally responsible and accountable. Environmental challenges, climate change emergencies activate new forms of urban ecologies, envisioning sustainable densities and infrastructures. And renewable energy resources are opening up new architectural territories and opportunities. And students travel and they want to see places and they want to experience, and in this case, they are. Uh, at the NL site, the industrial site of NL, they want to understand obsolete and abandoned industrial context. I had the great pleasure to uh, co-curate with Antonino Di Raimo the section architecture as caregiver with the exhibition correlated resiliencies in the 2021 Architecture Venice Biennale featuring faculty and student works in the Italian pavilion Resilient Communities, curated by Alessandro Melis. And um, Correlated Resiliencies uh, is the title of our presence at the Biennale, not just with exhibitions, but with a series of interventions, panel discussions, uh, um, really trying to really be uh, uh, a big voice, uh, bringing the school to participate into this voice. And we have, we were very sensitive in a gender equal uh, team uh, of participants among our students. And we were presenting work on community design and resiliency, but also computational design, fabrication, technologies were also uh, part of the conversation. Um, Professor Marcella del Signore, again, together with Pablo Lorenzo Eiroa, 
presented exhibitions also at the European Cultural Center in Palazzo Bembo, extending our discourse on the integration of emergent technologies with other significant and sensitive discussions and issues. By bringing together stone and nature in a lively dynamic narration to inscribe a public open room, uh, Christian, my partner, Christian Pongra, speaking about couples in being professionals together in architecture and in our research, we designed the installation CRISPR as a sensorial immersion into exaptation as a reflection on the passing of time and the uniqueness of an inspiring place where we can go through history of transformations and the Arsenale, one of the landmark of Venice was the perfect, perfect place for that reflection. Community engaged projects like um, such as the Avenue J, um, I want to bring this picture because it's not just the analysis of a territory or a contest, an urban contest, but it's also how we can embed, be embedding technology and research into uh, transformation of that uh, particular place. And the urban of urban stage is to rethink downtown, is to rethink the typical street design and greenery of the city under a location that is a natural gateway to the plains with a library of desert cacti and native plants. The parameters here were adaptation, scalability, replicability, seriscaping as driving forces in the development of the project. And here we have some more uh, design ideas of the uh, importance also about the involvement of students, faculty, the city, um, from different perspectives, from different voices, and uh, an array of community players in the vision of the revitalization of downtown. I'm very much uh, interested in the impact of research on materials in the regeneration of cities and in sustainability. Uh, materials investigations engage uh, students in research and study of material properties and performances, unfolding the potential for design innovation in building components and assemblies. We study carbon nanotubes, aerogel, fiber reinforced polymers, but also material that uh, most importantly can push the boundaries of design. And I mentioned bio-based materials derived by living organisms, including plants, animals, uh, fungi or algae, or the structure of mycelium, the vegetative part of a fungus, uh, which is a natural polymeric composite fibrous material that is used, can be used in architecture and in design. Materials interact and adapt to internal and external environments. The space is fluid and complex envelope system are mediators and variable skins are receptors of forces. Building information, modeling, simulation, VR, UX, UI, robotics, and computational explorations are changing the way we see space, are assembled systems introducing responsive architecture that are producing a multitude of affects and effects. Um, the interest is to develop versatile material system which adapts uh, to structural loads and provide opportunities for self-sensing capabilities to achieve energy efficiencies and comfort. We study the relationship between materials and additive manufacturing. We see that it's possible to reach the elimination of waste by using recycled materials in the extrusion process. In conclusion, uh, this difficult time 
has brought us the momentum to critically think about the future we want to have together to overcome systemic barriers through a more human-built environment that facilitates social interaction, gender equality, supports the diversity of our collective communities, and where we can catalyze transformative cultural changes. A transformative urban regeneration is a process of vision, planning, and design innovation that plays a crucial role or critical role in addressing integrative and inclusive strategies, collaborative interdisciplinary contributions, able not only to respond to environmental health, economic and social crises, but to anticipate them. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, for a very inspiring talk. Really appreciate it. Thank you. There's a lot of questions later for our discussion. Thank you so much. Would yeah, you stop welcome. sharing so we can move on to Eva Castro and Ulla Hell? Hey, Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, the opportunity of being here today, sharing this space uh, and this time with all of you. Eva, one moment, please. Maria, can you mute yourself, please? Thank you. All right, Eva, all yours. Okay. So, um, I think we, um, our approach towards a regeneration um, has been, since the beginning of our practice, one that, uh, that has a slight uh, derivation from uh, re-evaluation to regeneration into possible ways of invention um, and projection of new futures. And we derive into um, living speculations, sometimes living speculations, sometimes more academic speculations but this is based on the firm belief that uh, tradition as we have known it within architecture perpetuates wrong patterns of both behavior and hence livability and whether our form of thinking of architecture has always attempted is to somehow undo such patterns of tradition by rethinking um, new forms of developing affiliations and, and social interactions among, among users. Um, we are kind of uh, heavily connected with academia, uh, be it me and SUTD or ULA and Innsbruck, our partners in China. And, and this makes very um, um, uh, easy to, to, to interact um, in academia and to feed back into our practice. And, um, and this has been forever always something that has fed into the way in which we think of our projects. Our projects are really um, a research by design, as we like to think about them. Um, what we are showing today is, um, if you wish, a bit of a melange, not chronologically melange, that goes from the larger scale where we worked with landscape urbanism into more architectural scales, perhaps to the scale of the, of the jewel, if you wish. And in each one of these projects, we have attempted to uncover what was our approach to regeneration, which is not always the regeneration of a city, um, but sometimes is the regeneration of a landscape or the, or the regeneration of a, of a form of culture as a, as a status quo. So um, the first project that we would like to share is, uh, is the a Xi'an Horticultural Expo, um, where um, this became very much the center of a much larger development. Um, we designed it to become the heart of a larger neighborhood that didn't exist at the time. So this became um, um, a sort of a reference for um, 
starting an, uh, an ecology of sorts so where water was being collected and redistributed to make out of an artificial condition such as it is an expo a permanent and more kind of a living dynamic organism throughout uh, its entire life. Um, this project furthermore uh, challenged the notion of the singular axis of power within the Chinese system of organization into this multiple system of paths that allow for hiding and, uh, and playing with the environment and rediscovering your positioning within the environment through the usage of the space. Um, our second project uh, sort of operates in a similar scale and is a recent uh, project that we have been working uh, in Turkey. Uh, is this near economics, economics School of Economics in uh, Izmir, uh, Turkey, and, and is a project where uh, the site is a very topographic site that it used to be a quarry. Um, so the originally um, strong topographic differences that have, have been enhanced by uh, this kind of a degradation of the landscape, um, generating landslides and, and all sorts of uh, uh, misusages of the space. And what we did is a re-reading of the topography, of the change topography. And this project becomes for us a second nature, a second skin to the actual um, skin or ground that it protects it. It kind of, uh, it gives it a second shape. And in doing that, it kind of uh, challenges the notion of what is that which we call natural and what is that which we call architectural or artificial, uh, kind of a weaving into a new form of amalgam, if you wish. Um, these are these are kind of a, a small canyons that are formed and these small canyons sort of echo uh, the existing topography but at the same time generate pockets for new forms of interaction so if it, that's my turn and what i show now are smaller projects located in italy in the italian alps uh, this now is a project uh, for a stain train station. It was a competition for urban regeneration. And the train station was brought closer to the center of the village, landing almost in a pedestrian zone. Um, the project dealt on one side with the regeneration of the areas around the old train station. Uh, but the most important design decision in our proposal uh, was to remove a central car access from a main road and instead to valorize the plaza just in front of the new train station, uh, giving priority to the pedestrians and creating a shared surface enabling, enabling uh, the non-motorized movement of people using public transport and marginalize and minimize the impact and the presence of the individual car. Um, the train station uh, is almost invisible, integrated in an underpass, uh, and gives uh, the plaza gives values to, ex to existing values like a small church. Um, having said, uh, the project is on hold. <laughs> Uh, but I have to switch to the next one. Uh, this is the Strata Hotel and it continues extensions, uh, which deal with uh, building uh, within the steep landscape of the Dolomites within the Italian Alps in South Tyrol. Landscape in this context is seen as culture. And in what we are interested is in finding strategies, how to extend uh, those cultural landscapes how to extend them and merge them into buildings within the landscape. In these examples, uh, we took the stratification of the topogra topography into the building volumes, creating uh, and blending them within the landscapes. We create spaces that peel off and merge uh, with the landscape, and the build volume is seen as an addition to the topography, not only, but it merges with it. Uh, there is no distinction between facade and roof, and there is no clear boundary between building and landscape. 
uh, in the final of the additions, uh, we use a green roof and uh, those uh, wooden strips form a belly which form an entrance areas and all three neighboring volumes benefit from the in-between space between inside and outside uh, and wide openings even towards the sky and multiple, multiplicity of accesses. Then we come to a very small project, the Esker House. It is a micro regeneration of a house of the 60s, also a result of a competition. Uh, the pitched roof was removed and gives space uh, to a ground to build a new home uh, for next generation. Um, we start uh, to use the model of the outside access, access uh, stair to form a, really a landscape. Um, it is also almost seen as an esker, and it recalls also the surrounding landscape of the Dolomites. Um, the interior is then a mirror of the external geometry, giving space to the second generation uh, of inhabitants. So we see in here the internal spaces. The next project uh, is also a regeneration uh, then um, of uh, a historical building in a historical center of a small village. Again, it deals uh, with an existing building and it can be seen as a micro regeneration. The facade of the central plaza is listed and therefore we could only lift slightly the roof, uh, but we had to keep uh, the same rhythm. The back facade still, with, with, still deals with the mandatory pitched roof, but it proposes a slicing up and opening of the pitched roof and uh, in uh, by the strategy of deduction uh, we can allowing light uh, penetrating deep into the volume and most importantly we allow uh, outside spaces within the pitched roof at the end we create four independent apartments for the owner and his three daughters uh, and those are the result uh, of a formerly underused attic space uh, Inside, we have multiple of visual um, connections between inside and outside. And I think now I give again the word to Eva. Thanks, Ulla. Our last project is a, a sort of jewel embedded within this uh, macro hotel building where we um, could design one floor of that, uh, of that hotel. Um, our take in this hotel was uh, probably the most extreme in terms of building uh, new realities or kind of uh, inventing new fictions for uh, its inhabitants to spend a different time. In other words, we attempted to, instead of emphasizing the familiarity that normally hotels try to emphasize, to exacerbate that which makes you feel really uncomfortable, really at an odd positioning within yourself. And our hope in doing this, like in most of our projects, was to push the relationship of the user to the environment, generating um, a different engagement by understanding its own body and its own kind of agency within the space that it inhabits. Uh, this project is in Spain and is our last project for today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eva. Thank you, Ulla, for a fascinating presentation of your work. Um, it truly shows that we need a lot more women to break the boundaries here in, uh, in, our, in our fields. Thank you for this. Um, we have now Silvia Barbero, who is joining us from the Politecnico di Torino. Um, Silvia, you're ready to go with your talk, Give Birth to a World, Equality and Quality. Yes, thank you so much uh, for inviting me. It is an uh, uh, amazing event. I have a lot of uh, inspiration among all the other speakers of today. And I'm going to close this uh, a session of panelists, of wonderful women that work in the field of design and architecture. And yeah, I um, make this title, Giving Birth, because uh, yes, we are, uh, how we can differentiate men and women. I think that 
the only difference is that one. <laughs> uh, for the rest, uh, we are absolutely equal in all the possibility that we have. So I want to stress a little bit um, the role that women has in, in the world about working both on equality and quality, uh, quality in the sense of quality of life and environmental quality. Uh, so what I'm doing uh, in my university and my work, the Politecnico di Torino, uh, is to approach this complex problem with uh, a method that is the systemic design, uh, try to embrace this complexity and address uh, the change. Uh, first of all, understand what kind of change we would like to reach and then make the right tools to facilitate that work altogether. I mean, uh, it is always uh, a path together. So the, the problem, the environmental problem, it, it is uh, in a very urgent problem. Uh, I mean, that is just an example. I can make many examples of how uh, men and women are destroying our environment. Um, th that is the Atacama Desert in Chile, uh, where all our Western clothes uh, comes when we think that is the end, but we transform a wonderful natural place in, in a uh, landfill. Uh, so that is a picture of two years ago, and I think that the situation is just worse than what we can see now. Um, what we can do and what the design can do is, of course, operate at the beginning. As Chakara said, uh, uh, the environmental impact of all our action stay in the design phase. So we have um, an important role in that uh, in, in that game, let me say, the 80% of impact is decided and de determined in the design phase. So yes, we choose a wonderful job. Uh, I really enjoy to, to be a designer, to be a professor and so on, uh, and teach the design. I uh, see the passion also of the students in doing this ama amazing job. But what I always underline to my students is that we have a huge responsibility. We cannot uh, say that it is always someone else that decides or can change the world. No, it is our job to, to change the world. Um, and because all the problems uh, are interconnecting and we are in an age of so fast transformation, uh, like migration, environmental crisis, all the topics that we can read on the newspaper every day that are all interconnected and what the designer can do, but with a systemic approach is to understand first the complexity and try to manage it in order to uh, uh, forecast the future. I mean, I like the Italian word um, for design that is progetto, that comes from Latin words uh, that is pro yacere, so look forward. The designer has this capacity to see the things that the other cannot see right now, but uh, we help them to see that it can be possible for the future. So as uh, Barbara Klinkhammer at the beginning uh, underlined the important role of the sustainable development goal in order to have a goal to reach. Um, I think that it, it was a sort of revolution, the definition of this um, very uh, general but clear sustainable development goal helps all the world to have a direction, have a common uh, goals to, to work with, 
together. Uh, so, of course, today we are mainly focused on the number five and the number 11. So, uh, the uh, gender equality and the empowerment of women and how we can make these cities more sustainable and inclusive. And how uh, we can reach that goal and make this strategic deci decision uh, more uh, feasible. Uh, look um, this uh, scenario, multiple scenario that we can face um, in order to uh, help the people to approach that problems and also the solutions in a more flexible and open-minded way. Um, we uh, should uh, reach that goal as fast as possible, uh, otherwise we don't have any further chance to, um, to, to guarantee a better world to our uh, child. Uh, so the role of designer is a different level. So uh, it doesn't mean if it is producing a product or a system, uh, we have different degree of complexity, but it doesn't mean that a, a product is less important or less complex. Uh, to design than a social transformation. The approach is always the same. We look at the needs of people and we uh, try to, um, to address also more sustainable behavior in, in the people, even with a, a single object or a more complex social transformation. So we can work at different level and with different level of complexity, of course. So uh, the systemic design is uh, a merge of the design approaches that uh, give the tools to plan the future, the object and the other level that I said before, and the theory related to complexity that help us to manage that complexity. So from one side, we can understand the complexity and have the tools to manage it. And in the other side, we have all the tools that help us to design with that complexity, uh, something new and something more sustainable for the future. The systemic design is based on five pillars, but the, the uh, main uh, principle is that we should imitate the nature in what we are doing at industrial level uh, or at the city level in all our anthropic action uh, we should imitate the nature where we have no waste um, so first of all we should look at the output that we have in our industrial production, in our cities, in our in all our activities, not as waste, but as input for other uh, situation, for other entities, for other industries. Uh, that is the core that uh, allow us to generate that relationship between uh, different entities and create. Uh, um, a virtuous uh, network of companies that work together and doesn't waste anything in the environment. Uh, that, in that way, we create a uh, autopoietic system that is self-generated, self-supporting, uh, in order to to change if the uh, context and the situation in the context can can change. Uh, so it is fit mainly uh, in relation to a specific uh, context. Uh, so we cannot replicate a project uh, from one place to another like it is. Uh, we every time should do a specific project on it. Uh, and last uh, important uh, pillar of the systemic design is that is humanity center. So uh, all the humanity um, is in the mind of uh, the designer in that sense. We are not looking just at the certain role, uh, so the consumer or the producer 
for certain specific target, but the humanity in general, because we can um, um, give the solution for uh, a very large uh, audience, let me say. So what we need is to shift this paradigm. Uh, so move from a linear and reactive way of thinking in a more adaptive way that can embrace the complexity. I mean, we cannot drive it. We can adapt it. And um, let me say, be more um, in a more... Um, co-design way, so uh, have many uh, stakeholders involved in our project uh, in order to understand better that complexity with the different background and um, th that all the people has. So uh, in a linear mode, uh, you have a solve and fix um, way to act but in a complex, in a complexity environment, we should uh, uh, take into account all the actors involved and try to um, co-design the solutions. Uh, so the designer in that sense that put together the quadruple helix actor uh, can be the mediator uh, of all um, the, the stakeholder involved. And um, uh, what is the aspect of the involvement uh, and the co-design process, the co-creation process uh, in that kind of project? Uh, of course, we will have uh, in-deep knowledge at different scales, as I showed before. Uh, we can have um, decision-making and policy-making that are more long-term um, perspective and facilitate also the implementation. What we design, co-design can be uh, more long-lasting in the time. And last but not least, uh, we can develop programs that are uh, specific for the needs of specific territory. So that uh, quadruple helix and the uh, involvement of the stakeholder can uh, have the cap capacity to grow up um, the, the territory with an increasing of transparency of communication between all uh, the entities involved. So increase the trust also that is fundamental in that kind of processes, especially when we uh, speak about um, regeneration and the sort of social learning and capacity building of the uh, society. Uh, what I want to share with you today is our two examples uh, that we are running uh, here in Turin, but not only. Uh, the first one is Projireg, that is uh, um, an European project uh, um, and one of the uh, city uh, involved is the city of Turin, but not only, um, and the main topic is to uh, develop nature-based solutions that are uh, citizen-owned and could develop with them uh, in uh, post-industrial cities uh, that are involved in the project. So we um, could design the nature-based solution with the citizens uh, we monitor with the living labs how uh, those solutions can uh, be implemented and can continue also after the project. Uh, and the implementation will be in four uh, frontrunner cities, but other following cities uh, will be involved. So the frontrunner cities are Torino, Zagreb and Dortmund and Nimbo in China, and we have a series of follower cities like uh, Clujina, Poca, Zenica, Sofia, Pireus, Cascais in Portugal, um, in order to learn uh, from the experience of the frontrunner cities um, and uh, have uh, a, a more effective uh, way also in their uh, cities. So we run uh, many um, co-design session 
uh, in the different cities. Those are some pictures from uh, the city of Turin. Uh, and, uh, uh, for example, the SWOT analysis uh, was discussed many times with the different uh, stakeholders um, and the citizens in order to uh, have solutions that are fit and acceptable for uh, the district, uh, uh, especially because in all those cities, we are working in a very difficult district. Those are post-industrial districts that now are uh, with a low level of quality of life. Uh, so what we want to do is to improve the quality of life and the quality of the environment with uh, that kind of project. Last one is, last uh, example is uh, more related to the second part um, uh, of my intervention, that is the equality. Uh, I want to go further to the uh, uh, equality between gender, but also uh, if we think about the humanity, also the equality among all the people that lives now in our territory, uh, in, in our world, in our planet. Uh, so um, I'm also the chair of a, a non-profit association that is uh, Plug Creativity uh, that organizes every year a contest of poster, um, giving them, giving to the uh, designer community, graphic designer community in that uh, case, a um, topic related to uh, sustainability, social sustainability or environmental sustainability. And I want to show you uh, the results of that last year because uh, the, uh, the topic was digital inclusion and equality uh, was one of the um, aspects that all the designer um, uh, provide us. So th there is a video as my last intervention. So after the video, uh, my uh, speech will finish. So I leave you with that uh, uh, video of posters. <laughs>
Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you to you. Thank you. A very interesting and wonderful presentation. Um, so I wanted to, um, we're starting now our um, discussion. I think we have about, um, is that right, 10 minutes um, for the discussion that we have left. So um, I wanted to, first of all, say what an interesting and wonderful um, portfolio and broad perspectives of women in the architecture, design, and educational fields um, talking about um, urban regeneration. I mean, I'm just blown away by your presentations. Um, thank you. Um, I wanted to start with an opening question and um, put into context my own experience. Um, I have, when I started my career as a young architect coming out of um, college um, in the early 1990s, um, I studied at the RWTH in Aachen in Germany. Um, I came out and started um, to the chagrin of my professors. I had several offers for my professors to work for their practices who were all male. And I actually told them, no, I'm going to start at an all female practice. I had an offer from an unknown small firm at the time with 13 women who worked together. And I will never forget the camaraderie, the way of how we worked together was so different than in the previous offices where I worked before in a way that these women saw the world that they designed. They brought so much empathy to the design, so much of what we heard here today, co-creation processes, right? Um, ways of looking at a design process that is inclusive, not exclusive. And um, I, I will never forget that. And I think that um, that leads to my first question in over the past centuries, cities, around the world were predominantly designed and developed by male architects commissioned by other men in powerful political positions. In what way do you think would have cities been different if developed by women? And in what way do female designers, architects and urban designers today impact urban regeneration? What is different? And I'm putting this out as an opening question to all of you to respond to this. Who wants to go first? Maybe we'll start with Francesca. Oh, it's Maria, go ahead. <laughs> I think he's going back to uh, what we were discussing before about mentorship, encouragement, about empowering women to be really a voice that is not just heard, but well represented. It's not just about what you say, it's also the representation of what you say. And the fact that, you know, there are no, so many women in leadership, in governance, in public forums where they can contribute with ideas, with uh, projects, with against stereotypes. I was just reading yesterday, um, you see the use of public space. And I saw this picture of this woman going with the stroller with a little baby using the public space. Actually, we saw Ukrainian, right? There is that image all those little uh, strollers uh, empty of kids. Um, well, there is no relationship with the stereotype that I want to say, but sometimes the idea associated to women of the use of public space is very much related to stereotypes. And I think it's time to overcome that. Uh, we have voices, we have representation that is important to happen. We have perspectives. We should be and we must be part of policies and gov govern governance. We must be uh, central to the urban planning, to the idea of how our city can be regenerated through our contribution. Thank you, Maria. Somebody else who wants to chime in? Sylvia, you yes. are with you. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, I'm totally uh, agree with uh, Maria about that part of uh, stereotype uh, because and we always should pay attention on on it, also on our action. And uh, I mean, I think that we are managing uh, 
uh, project and groups of uh, other people. Um, so um, from our everyday job, we should take care about the stereotype that we um, was born with. Uh, so to, to change it, uh, we really should pay attention to also the words that we use uh, when we present something. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, often I, I see the representation with just the women with the stroller and I always change it. I say, no, I want the dad that is doing that action. I mean, they have two hands like us. So as I said at the beginning of my presentation, the only diversity is that women can give birth and the men not, but all the other stuff can be done by both. So we should pay attention on it. And I think that also the men and are very open on it. I, I meet a lot of men that are more feminist than uh, women <laughs> sometimes. So uh, I think that the time is ready. We, it is a, 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 a learning process. I mean, I don't believe in revolution. Uh, it is an evolution and uh, all people from both gender can um, improve uh, the way to think the future with that uh, with that way of thinking, and I personally, you start with a, a personal experience, and I uh, often uh, have some man colleague that told me uh, what about my team of work. That is, ninety uh, percent is. Uh, uh, done by women and they told me you are doing a, a reverse uh, um, discrimination you are selecting just women I say no I'm selecting the best doesn't matter what is the gender of them then I think we lost Sylvia Sylvia can you hear us Okay, you can hear me, right? Or is it my computer? Okay. All right. So I think we just jump off here to the next question. Or does somebody else want to chime in um, with the first question, the opening question? Okay, then I'm going to ask you the next question. And I would like to actually go to the educators here. We have several educators. Um, I counted four, if I'm right. Sylvia, we moved on. So you were broken up. Um, so here's my question to the educators, Maria, Eva, Ulla, and Sylvia. As educators, how do you teach the next generation of architects and designers to create a built environment for a more equitable, inclusive, and diverse society? What are the change, changes you're observing in this young generation of designers? And maybe we start with, I don't know, um, would it be okay to go to a Maria had already talked at this point? Um, Sylvia talked, Eva and Ulla, would you like to respond to this? Sure. Um, I think uh, uh, for the start uh, is, uh, is um, all the different youth uh, within, uh, within the different universities where we teach are possibly uh, very diverse. So my youth is an Asian population and they are very young students. They're, they're younger than what we are normally used to, um, to have in, in Europe or, or even in the US. Um, so that, that, that is an important detail because they come with a certain kind of a degree of a, a immaturity, if you wish, right? Which I find that that is a, a rather positive thing because when they come so young, their minds are much more malleable 
um, it is easier to kind of uh, develop some intrinsic transformations in the way in which they think about the world. I um, I have to say, for me, it is uh, um, the most important thing within teaching um, to to get the students to be critical about their environment. So we work with this population very much uh, within Southeast Asia, where they can be contextualized and they can understand what they see and be critical about what they see. Criticality is probably the first step in order to be able of uh, upon that observation of wanting to engage and change what they are seeing. Um, I don't believe in tradition and I don't believe in uh, typologies, even within architecture. I think we have had uh, too much of that already. And, uh, and that is one of the things that within all exercises that we develop with the students, we tried to do. We tried to get them to think off the box from within a critical uh, point of view of how, um, let's say, the world that we inhabit is the resultant of our uh, old habits and how those old habits need urgently um, to be changed. So if we want to think of a different future. Thank you, Eva. Ulla, would you like to contribute to this? Okay, <laughs> yes. My students are uh, probably a lot older than Eva's because I'm uh, teaching in Innsbruck and it's towards the end of the career. Uh, and I must say, I noticed um, a raised consciousness in approaching uh, subjects, if I compare it uh, maybe to 10 years ago. So I, I feel it's a very uh, po positive uh, uh, evolution of, of, of how the next generation and young designers uh, will contribute to the creation of our future. So it's really this Thank increased you. consciousness to, to a, a multiplicity of, of themes. Might it be inclusion, uh, ecological aspects, uh, building techniques. So I'm, I'm very positive and try to stimulate and uh, look forward. Thank you, Ola. Maria, I'm thinking, can you bring the U.S. perspective into this? Yeah, sure. I, mean, uh, I actually believe that education is an important and critical platform to overcome uh, systemic barriers. And I'm invested in all my career and all my life in uh, mentoring and being, I don't know if I am a good role model, but, you know, we try at least to offer uh, some mentorship based on what we have achieved and who we are. And we have the privilege to be educators. Uh, I consider myself an educator that actually have the chance to lead a school. Uh, but in my deep, profound nature, I believe I am much more an educator than an administrator. And that's how I uh, actually face my job every day. And it's important, it's important to be out there and in front of your students with honesty, believing in what you do, uh, making the difference for, for them and uh, work with intentionality about a far reaching change. And it's an everyday work. Uh, we are not yet there, but we are really progressing towards an increase of female participation. Participation and representation are very important. And for example, you can be very intentional in your hiring processes, really focusing. Uh, do I have a pool of candidates that is really diverse and inclusive about leadership position in our organization, student organization, in our teamwork, in our leadership opportunities for our students is about the culture that we are setting in our schools, is about how is this permeating all our activities, courses, studios, uh, curricula, uh, the culture of the school needs to face that and needs to be aware that there are efforts and perspectives that needs to be, um, you know, visible. Thank you, Maria. 
I pass the ball to Francesca here. So Francesca, you are a strong advocate for women in architecture. You probably have the largest platform um, in the, or women in architecture and design. You probably have the largest platform in the, in the world that actually puts together a world map of female designers and architects. So I wonder how you see this. I mean, a lot of the, um, in the, the architects who you presented were young designers. So yes. what do you see in this? What are the changes that you're observing in this younger generation of designers, female designers? Well, first of all, I think that uh, um, what we try to highlight is also a different kind of uh, success in architecture. So for sure, even when we had to select these uh, outstanding women, we were looking at prizes, uh, awards, and maybe publications. And so, uh, and we were looking also at the way women architects are presenting themselves online with their website and with their online tools. But on the other hand, we were very interested also in seeing different way to, to push themselves forward. So we gave also importance to, um, for instance, influencers that are on online on Instagram, for instance, and they're already sharing the value of architecture in a very different way from the one we we saw in, in our educational years. So they transfer um, not only the aesthetics of architecture, but mainly the profession itself. And I think that, for instance, this kind of role models are really uh, helping new generation of architects in feeling more uh, self-conscious of their abilities. So there is a different kind of architecture that is less rigid and more fluid that gets transferred by this younger generation of architects. And I'm very keen on seeing um, what they are doing and the effect they are having on younger generations. So for us, success, being successful in architecture is about sharing the value of architecture and uh, not only uh, being um, trying to achieve a solo position, which is what we saw and we read in books uh, until now, and we still see very much happening with Archistars on magazine. So we try to dismantle that uh, kind of system. Thank you so much, Francesca. It Thank almost, you. I mean, if I may summarize this here, what I'm hearing is no more manifestors in architecture <laughs> and moving to design is about life in the words of Maria Pavellini. Right. So I think this is um, this is maybe a really good ending for um, what we have been doing here. I wanted to thank all of our speakers for a wonderful sharing your perspectives, sharing your work and your research. Um, it was really, really interesting to see these um, perfect perspectives from um, between um, Italy and the United States and including some of the perspectives from Singapore and Asia. So. Um, very fascinating. I'd like to thank uh, Alessandro Melis and uh, Fabio Finotti for inviting all of us here so and giving us the opportunity to speak um, about a women's perspective um, in urban regeneration, on urban re regeneration. So I really appreciate this. And uh, with that, I pass it back to um, Alessandro. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Barbara. Thank you, Barbara. This has been, I hope that my only, uh, let's say, final remarks is that I hope that this is just the uh, first step of uh, a series of events that will be linked to this, this topic that I think is uh, something that uh, is very meaningful in terms of impact for all the communities. I would like to uh, link this to what uh, uh, one of the slides that Francesca was showing is, and I think it's, this is very important, we are discussing here uh, the importance of the women perspective as a first step to engage more and more with diversity in the future. So the key is diversity. The more we have uh, uh, redundancy, uh, diversity and variability in the city, the more we have, we have hope to be resilient in times of uh, global uh, crisis. So uh, I, I see this as an opportunity to discuss in the future about the women perspective, about maybe uh, non-human presence in the built environment and even about non-living presence in the built environment. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Barbara, for this great uh, moderation of the event.
and thank you very much to all the institution. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank you, Barbara. Thank Wonderful you. moderation. Thank, thank you, you to all the guests, guests. all our distinguished guests. I think we all start leaving, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you.